Before I explain the rules, I have some relevant info for you. This challenge was already done very recently by a YouTuber named Cly. I highly recommend watching that video alongside this one. It's very well done, and he is even stricter than I am with the rule set. So if you really enjoyed this type of challenge, luckily for you, there's not one, but two videos about it already out. So I'll leave that in the description, along with the original video that inspired this idea, which was the Elden Ring challenge run by JK Leeds. Now, let's explain the rules for the challenge. I can only use equipment I find in a level to progress through it. For example, if I find a greatsword in 1-3, it can only be used in 1-3. I am not allowed to use it in any other levels. Also, remember that in Demon Souls, the area design is different than the other games. Each archstone is split into distinct levels marked by a checkpoint. So unlike the other games, I cannot use equipment found in the area as a whole, but only within a level of the area. For example, Stonefang Tunnel is not counted as a whole area like it would be in Dark Souls, but rather each checkpoint or level is its own area in this challenge. While most consumables are limited to the level I found them in, I will make some exceptions. I will allow healing items to carry over into the next level. However, if I run out of healing items, I cannot restock them. I must either farm more within the level or suck it up until I beat the boss. Soul items are allowed at any point in the game, and I also am allowing weapon upgrades. But I can only upgrade them with materials found within the level, if I upgrade them at all. Thankfully, most bosses in Demon Souls can be done just fine without upgrading your weapon. I am also allowed to repair my weapon at the Nexus if it breaks for any reason. As usual, duplication is allowed, but only to meet weapon stat requirements. This is really important in this game, because most enemies don't drop many souls unless you want to get pure black world tendency. I won't duplicate to do anything stupid like give myself 99 strength for the first area. I'll try to be fair. One more thing about upgrades is I'm allowed to use boss souls to make a weapon despite having to leave the area to transpose them. If I happen to find an enemy that drops a demon soul within a level, the weapon it makes can still count as equipment found in the level. This technically could apply to any boss, since you pick up the soul on the archstone that starts the next area, but usually it's not necessary because there are other weapons available. It's mainly important for the penultimate boss of an area, where you may not have any other options. Like the Dark Souls 2 version I did, I'm allowed to use any type of ammo for a bow or crossbow that I found within a level. I also am allowed to go to any merchant to restock ammo. That should be all the rules, so it's time to start the challenge. I decided to go with the Knight class for the Mailbreaker weapon, since it's a possible drop from Dreglings in this area. Although, I think it's fair to use starter equipment in the tutorial area anyway. After being away for a while, this game is quite an adjustment. The biggest thing to remember is that there's no poise, so frame data is more important when attacking. A smaller thing is that plunging attacks were introduced in Dark Souls, and as much as we all make fun of them, trust me when I say you really do appreciate things more when they're gone. There's not much to pick up here but I do get a good amount of healing grass, so on to the vanguard we go. I wasn't expecting the damage to be that low, but at least this guy has a predictable moveset, so patience is key here. The best thing to do is try to get him in a loop of ground pounds, which are very punishable. And you know, maybe don't walk right into his axe as he's winding it up to swing. The result would have been the same either way, we're still a lost soul with no choice but to take on the demon-infested streets of Boletaria. I was pleasantly surprised by fists and demon souls. Without poise, you can stunlock most enemies and, in many cases, finish them off before you run out of stamina. On top of that, the damage isn't much worse than some of the weapons in this game. This is my favorite way to take out the enemies here, but even I was once lured in by the beckoning of the sparkly void. There's a lot of fire bombs to pick up here as loot and enemy drops. Those will be useful for the boss of the level. A second mailbreaker, don't mind if I do. But this reunion will be a quick one. Because I'd much rather use the bastard sword. 
Don't even bother with this guy, it's not worth it. This time I made it to the shortcut, and waiting at the end of it is the Kling Ring, the most useful ring in the game that we only get to use for the easiest level. And if you manage to cut the chain, you can get some stylish robes, as well as some complimentary deodorant. Good thing I'm playing as a lady today, otherwise I would not have access to this set. Thank god that feature was removed in future titles. Here's another removed feature that really caught me off guard. If you run against a ledge, you could accidentally climb over it and be forced into a rescue mission. Ostrava also loves to sneak up behind me and waltz into my swings, then acts like I'm the one going crazy. As the kids say, I let this dragon cook for a bit, then muster the courage to cross the bridge when most of the enemies are cleared. Now we can release the phalanx. Definitely grab this turpentine before the fight. It gives you a pretty ridiculous damage boost. I start things out by chucking my supply of firebombs into the fray, and once the little ones are gone, we can hit the main body. I get a few hits in with the bastard sword, and then switch back to firebombs for the last chunk of its health bar. For some reason, I started free aiming and just threw a couple at the floor, but it's not a setback in this case. And one more swing of the sword is enough to finish the job. I'm not ready to hear this motif yet. Now that we can finally level up, the first stats to get upgraded are going to be Strength and Dexterity. As always, Dexterity is more of a priority, since two-handing doesn't change the requirements. Since our strength is already pretty high, I decided to get some Vitality because we're gonna have to get used to having no health. To keep world tendency high, one must reach terminal velocity in the Nexus. So here we are in 1-2. The first piece of equipment I get is pretty useless, because I don't think any enemies inflict bleed here. Astrava is back, and he gives us some useful healing items which I'll try not to waste. I accept my fiery death so I can have a weapon. And jeez, can this guy stop sneaking up behind me? On one of these towers, we can get a bow. And if you're willing to risk your life again, there's also the spiked shield. Let me just say that a shield has no business being this fast. Without poise, this thing bashes the enemies into oblivion. I spend the next half hour grinding souls for the crossbow because I hate this boss run back and want that dragon gone. So after another half hour or more, I patiently chip away at its health bar. It's worth it in this case. I use those souls for more vitality, as you can never have enough in soul form. The Tower Knight sure looks intimidating, but you can think of this guy as a proto-iron golem. Everything about this fight is pretty gimmicky, including the arena. It's like the one reborn. You have to get rid of some snipers, but after that, you're in the clear for a simple boss fight. The Tower Knight is basically a giant inflatable so you have to punch a few holes in his legs until he deflates and falls over. Oh yeah, this guy can one-shot. I really need to remember how to fight this again. Anyways, here's what we want. He's out of air, he falls over, and then we can hit his head for full damage. Well, that was stupid of me, wasn't it? This guy only has two or three close-range attacks, so as long as you watch out for the lingering AoE, this fight is very easy. Be sure to try to get him to fall in an opportune location. Sometimes his head can kind of get clipped in the wall, which is very annoying. There we go. The spiked shield was a surprisingly fun weapon, but rules are rules, so we'll have to part with it. My vitality is already at 20 and next I decide to even out Strength and Dexterity. After using some soul items, I have one more level left over, so I also put a point into Endurance. 2-1 is a fun area, and we can get in the swing of things right away with a pickaxe from the local merchant. The enemies here drop lots of upgrade materials, and according to the rules, we'll be able to start using them here. I come back around to get some sticky white stuff since it's effective for the boss. Ed will upgrade our pickaxe for us. Plus two should be enough to clear out those enemies faster. Once again, a ring placed in the wrong area. For magic users, the Chris Blade is very useful. But as far as I know, it won't give a boost to sticky white stuff buffs, so I'm not going to use it. The graphics started freaking out a bit here. 
As I expected, the pickaxe is very effective against the armor spider. But still, that greed is gonna make me die to this, which would be a little embarrassing even for me. When it starts that fire attack, as long as you run to the fog gate, you shouldn't get hit. Just don't try to run back into it prematurely. I got hit by the silk like an idiot and was a millisecond away from being incinerated. But after another buff of the pickaxe, I can triumphantly say I didn't die. The souls gained from that are enough to get dex all the way to 20, with some left over for other stats. While the pickaxe is still available in 2-2 and isn't illegal according to the rules, I wanted to mix it up and let go of it in favor of different weapons. The first weapons I get are the Hands of God, but I can't use those right now, so I set off in search of other weapons. I was too stubborn to let Patches trick me, so I spent the next 10 minutes punching this bug to death so I could get the Ring of Flame Resistance and a club. It's also quite funny to see Patches nearly get killed in the explosion. I know it's a bad idea, but after getting all that stuff, I go straight to the Flame Lurker. The damage on the club is disappointing, to put it mildly. In order to gauge the effectiveness of the Flame Resistance Ring, I willingly roll into all of his attacks, and intentionally stand in this lava pit. It was all for the purpose of gathering data. The club is terrible and it's not the weapon I wanted to use anyway. I had been eyeing the Hands of God since I picked them up, so I duplicated some souls for the Faith requirement and tried this again. The damage difference is significant enough to make them worth using, but I don't think I'm ready for this fight, and having such low health means rolling the wrong way will cost my whole health bar. In the meantime, I jump ahead to World 3, where the area boss will be much easier to deal with. I get a cool set near the beginning of the level, as well as several weapons to choose from. Though it was fun punching the guys in the cells. For most of the level, I stick to the secret dagger, as it gets the job done and is useful for backstabbing the Mind Flayer enemies. Once again, playing as a lady will give us access to some specific equipment, like these silver bracelets, which give us more souls from enemy kills. And it's pretty unfair that by choosing a male character, you can miss out on gear like this. Eventually, I come across the S-Dock, and it becomes my weapon of choice for the remainder of the area. Something overcame me at the arrow trap, and I made a brave attempt to evade the oncoming arrows by hugging these walls. On this last one, either I didn't go far enough, or it was somehow placed differently, but that didn't work out. It was brave, yes, but not necessary. So I clear the rest of the level and went behind it to shut it down like a normal person, and was free to grab some soul items and the clever rat's ring. It's a good ring, but I don't end up using it since I didn't feel confident keeping my health that low. First things first, we're gonna make sure this guy's dead, then let the invader take care of me. As long as I can skirt around the invader, there's nothing else blocking the way to the fool's idol. She doesn't pose much of a threat herself, that's not to say she's totally defenseless, but not as intimidating as Flame Lurker. Be sure to get lots of hits in on her. Once you're close, she becomes very passive, and you can keep hitting her as she vanishes. A mechanic that still exists in Elden Ring. To nobody's surprise, I was an idiot and died to her sorcery on my first attempt. And it's one hit away too. Oh well, maybe next time. At least dying to a trap would give me some sort of excuse. Thankfully, I escaped and was able to quickly finish her on the second try, so now it's time to move on. I have no plans to go towards the Maneater, so to the Nexus it is. After getting some levels, I weigh my options and try to take on 5-1 for the next two hours. There are some weapons you can get easily, like this Morning Star, which also is good for bleeding out the locals. After not so patiently running through hordes of enemies, I finally get lucky enough to snag the Blessed Mace. However, I quickly got tired of being one-shotted by the pokey dudes, so I switched gears and went to World 4. Just for fun, I traded with the Crow and got some packs of arrows, along with other mostly useless trinkets. The skeletons didn't make it easy for me, but I did manage to get the Kulich and came back for the Uchi Katana. 
The Shrine of Storms has never been my strong suit, and I wasn't making any progress here. And now that I tried out the other levels, I decided that Flame Lurker was actually the easiest thing to do. No, it wasn't easy because I cheesed him by standing behind the bones. What makes you say that? Sometimes the hands of God have a little trouble reaching him, but they'll work once you hit in the right place. Every now and then, he also got bored of the repetition and started to pretend like I didn't exist. In phase two, I legitimately can't even see this guy, but after each hit, he's locked into a slam loop, so it's easier than the first phase. It was a 15 minute fight, but at least it was easy, and I can progress without having to get good at the game. Just a little more vitality, and we're off to finish the Stonefang Tunnel. Dragon God is another gimmick boss. I think I remember the gist of how to do this. He can't see me behind these pillars, so there's no way for him to- Who needs a weapon for this anyway? I can split columns with my bare hands. Any minute now. I should have known. Take two. I remember to take a left turn to pick up the Dragon Bone Smasher that's available in pure white tendency only. Stats don't matter in this case. The weapon is heavy enough to break the debris faster than my fists. All we gotta do is fire off the spears and the rest is straightforward. It'll be much easier to get past the debris with my trusty sword. Anyways, there's only one more ballista, and once the dragon is down, he only has the strength for a single pathetic attack. So there's nothing to worry about. We've slain our first archdemon. Vitality is a high priority in this run, so I'll get it all the way to 30. If we ever need one, Ed can now make soul weapons with the Flame Lurker's soul. We're probably ready for 3-2 now. The first thing on the agenda is to carefully drop down this ledge to get the Rune Sword. I don't have enough magic to wield it, so you know the drill. The base magic damage is very high for an unupgraded weapon, so it'll be very helpful for most of the enemies. For enemies that are magic resistant, there's a flamberge nearby that we can use as needed. Now that I'm armed, it's time to unchain the brain. Thankfully, quitting out still works in Demon Souls, so the Gloom set is ours now. I know I can't wear this without being heavy, but there's nothing wrong with trying it on to see how it looks. After releasing the brain, we're free to pick up the myriad of equipment it was hiding underneath. The gold mask looks pretty cool, but sadly I can't wear it without being heavy. I'm not expecting to win anytime soon, so when I finally can challenge the man-eaters, I make a beeline to the full moon grass and then kind of wing it from there. Those first three hits are about the extent of my progress. I end up switching to the Epe. The fire damage makes easy work of the Mind Flayer guarding the Fog Gate, and it has good range and can hit them while they're flying. I was making such good progress on this fight, I didn't want to let this one slip away. To make sure I didn't get one shot by any pounces, I went to body form and hoped for the best. All my healing grass was gone, and once the first man-eater was out of the picture, I switched to the rune sword to finish the job. My heart was beating so fast, and when it was all done, I could enjoy some extra souls with the Ring of Avarice. This time I had enough for a little endurance. With no other weapons available, we're gonna have to use a boss soul for the first time. The only weapon you can get from the man-eaters is this dagger called the Needle of Eternal Agony. Why is it called that, you ask? Probably because the damage is so low that you'll be in agony for the rest of your life if you use it. Alright, here's how we're gonna go about this. Bring all the enemies to the edge of the arena, hit them, and they just disappear. I don't care where they go, all that matters is they're gone. It even works on the Mind Flayers as long as you backstab them in the right place. Now, the important part. How's the damage look on the old monk? That's not very promising. Well, maybe it's better than fists. Let's at least compare them before jumping to conclusions. Oh, so it's the same. 
Okay, how about backstabs? 52. I'll remember that number. I'm not looking forward to this at all. 57 with fists. Thanks for letting me know, game. I wasted time making a weapon that does less damage than my fists. In theory, the 20 souls you get on hit is supposed to compensate, but is it really that much of a trade-off? That's an inefficient way to get souls as it is. I mean, come on, it can't at least do more damage than bare fists? It was a little fun to use it as a tracker for how many hits it took me, but that 8800 down there is after multiple attempts, so I lost track anyway. In case you were curious, that fight took nearly 20 minutes. Not counting all the times I died and had to redo the run back. Never in my most twisted fantasies did I think I'd have more trouble with Old Monk than the Maneaters. I revisit 5-1 with a new strategy, which is to do it in body form. I have some really close calls with the big guys, but there's plenty of places to hide, and the merchant sells good healing items. So I was able to power through all the diseases and reach the boss. Leechmonger is never an issue, and with all the black turpentine the enemies kindly dropped for me, I can be assured that there's nothing to worry about. Well, I do get turned into a mini leechmonger when I enter the arena, but none of its attacks are very devastating. That's half its HP in 10 seconds, and I actually picked a weaker weapon to test if bleed worked against it. It doesn't, but you can see that it hardly matters. I've still got the Blessed Mace in my offhand for regeneration, and the Leechmonger does some regeneration of its own. I almost feel bad for it. It can try to heal its body, but the wounds I inflicted on its self-esteem can never be healed. Now we're really getting into the heart of the Defilement. They were nice enough to give us the Regenerator's Ring, but not having a status bar to show the poison takes some getting used to. I took to the War Scythe pretty quickly, and started making my way through the swamp to find anything I could scavenge from the small islands. There's a bigger island right before the Fog Gate, and the key here is to aggro one enemy at a time so you don't get overwhelmed. The bleed is useful for taking out the big guy since he has so much health. Before we go any further, stop for a second. This is really important. You gotta see this. Aww. These little mosquitoes are, dare I say, worse than the Blighttown ones. Yeah, the Blighttown ones are annoying, but at least they don't do that much damage. I seriously almost died by being sucker punched by a mosquito! While I love having the cute dev cat on my screen, the Thief's Ring will let me bypass all the enemies that have been killing me on the platforms, and I'll be walking through the swamp now, so I don't have to worry about fall damage. Aside from restocking my grass, I buy some rotten arrows from the filthy woman, which I don't end up using. It takes a few deaths, but I finally reach the shortcut, and can challenge the boss without worries. Dirty Colossus is another pushover. I guess to compensate for that god-awful level it puts you through. If you have Black Turpentine on hand, by all means use it and just keep on hitting. The flies are the only real threat. If you circle around the boss, the melee attacks never connect. Like most bosses, the fight is only around a minute long with a buffed weapon. As for the next fight, the story will be much different. We couldn't get a weapon for it even if we wanted to. The only thing you can get from the Dirty Colossus soul is Acid Cloud, which is useless in PvE. With what we're gonna have to do, it's crucial to get as much endurance as we can. The real fight here is not Astraea, but her lackey, Garl Vinland. He's gonna be annoying for several reasons, some of which you're gonna see here in a second, but of course the main issue is not having a weapon. On the first attempt, I somehow missed the bridge and fell down to the swamp area, so I quit out and tried it again. Okay, so my real first attempt. If you're lucky, you can get healing items from the enemies in the arena, and since this is the only boss fight where that's possible, I decided to only use healing items dropped by the enemies. Trying this in body form may have been a mistake, but I was starting to feel a little confident since I could roll out of the way after attacking and that confidence may have been a bit misguided. 
four consecutive attempts, I started going for backstabs instead. All it took was baiting an attack and going behind him. I also never went back to replenish my grass because I was worried he'd run off to Astraea and never come back. I kept running around and teasing him until he attacked, and this went smoothly and he didn't run away a single time. But it all fell apart when I misjudged his attack. It's been a while, so I forgot that this is not Wrath of the Gods, but him healing himself to full health. This really pissed me off. But that wasn't even all the taunting he had in store for me. He used my own tactics against me for the literal and figurative finishing blow to my soul. The backstabbing wasn't going to work, and I realized there was no running from what I had to do. I was in the same boat as Cly for this and had to compose myself long enough to parry him to death. Parrying is a better strategy than backstabbing because there's no chance of him healing or running away, but you are two shots away from death with no place to run and no time to heal. Getting the timing down took a long time. It's a bit of a late timing, so you have to be ready to delay your parry. However, this wasn't as bad as I thought it would be, and eventually I was able to do it without getting hit. To reward me for all my hard work, he gives me an armor set that is once again gender-locked. Garl Vinland is no more, and we can give Astraea a homeward bone to send her to Firelink Shrine safe and sound. Like I said, you can't ever have enough vitality. We're back at the Shrine of Storms, with more health to tank through the skeletons, this time reaching the compound longbow. Using the 20 arrows I got from the crow, as well as the other light arrows I have, I can get the vanguard to roughly half of his health, and use bleed to take care of the other half. Now we'll be able to make a weapon from his soul. At 340 base damage, the dozer axe will make this area 10 times easier. It only takes one more point into strength to two-hand it. And then we're all set. This thing truly lives up to its name. It turns you into a walking bulldozer that flattens everything in its way. Even the once frightening red-eyed skeletons cower before the strength of the dozer. The Adjudicator was the easiest boss in the whole run with this thing. Three hits to the scar and it falls down, leaving it open for some crazy damage. I might have done this in one go had I not whiffed one of those swings. Adjudicator was ridiculously easy, it didn't even hit me, and it's all thanks to this wonderful weapon. Saying goodbye is the hardest part. Right down the stairs, we meet up with the merchant we rescued way back, and can buy some light armor to wear. I stock up on kunai, get a bow, and buy a falchion to take with me through the level. Patches is holding something that I really want, and I make the mistake of trying to kill him with such a weak weapon. Man, they really nerfed him in other games. Patches was an absolute nightmare to kill with his regeneration and blocking skills. I had to lure him out to the beginning of the level in order for him to turn his back long enough. One of the enemies finished him off for me, and I got to take his thief's ring for myself. I know it wouldn't technically be breaking the rules to equip the one I found earlier, but it just felt like a cop-out. And trust me, it was all worth it. The thief's ring makes traversing this level much less painful, and makes you unnoticeable to the manta rays. The old hero fight can either be really difficult or really easy. It all depends on how you do it. If you were in soul form with a thief's ring like me, it's probably the easiest fight in the game, mechanically. He can be poisoned with the kunai. And since we make no sound, he has no idea where we are. And even right after attacking him with the falchion, he still goes the wrong way. If you keep him poisoned and stay on the opposite side of the arena, he's completely helpless. It was a long and uneventful fight, but a very simple one. I got some vitality and some dexterity with all those souls before quickly proceeding to the Storm King. For him, we have a weapon in the arena that we're meant to use. The same weapon that makes a cameo in Dark Souls 3. A fun fact about me is that I didn't even know this weapon existed on my first playthrough and wondered why this boss was so hard to hit. Area exploration is good for you. The only thing this guy has is this spear attack that's really dangerous, and it killed me several times. I managed to find a safe place to stand behind a rock, 
carefully waiting out the spear attack each time, and landing a final hit after a couple cycles. When I got back to the Nexus, I tried to duplicate the boss soul and ended up mistiming it and losing all the souls I got. But they were duplicated, so I just used them until I got an equivalent amount of souls back. Plus an extra 20k, apparently. I was able to finish leveling decks with that, so I put the leftover souls into Vitality. 1-3 has this useful fireball to take care of the enemies for you, provided they don't block your exit. As long as that doesn't happen, you can get the whole gang down here with you until you make the pile of bodies so big that the living ones can't reach the fire anymore. When we're this late into the game, the high price tag on the Claymore is no longer a problem. Or, for free, we could use the Greatsword right outside his shop. Both have their pros and cons. The Claymore is faster, but does less damage. While the Greatsword is very slow, but more powerful and able to knock down enemies after each hit. I tend to use the Claymore in large groups of enemies, and the Greatsword to take out stronger ones like the Fat Officials. You have a sword and a shield? Can't you see I've got my own problems? This is the third time. The penetrator takes his life, and I take his fashion. We can fight him to a totally fitting soundtrack, or should I say, a laugh track. This will be a fast-paced fight, so the Claymore is the better choice for this. Damage is low, but this fight isn't too difficult. Especially with enough health to take a hit or two. I got hit a lot on this fight by being greedy, but somehow I didn't die. Usually rolling away or into his attacks will work, and when he, uh, penetrates, simply step to the side and claim those free hits. Or take a quick break to munch on some grass. When I'm done with that, I use the same strategy on this NPC that I used on Patches, so we can have a weapon for the level. I don't know why some random guy has the penetrator's sword, but I'm not one to ask too many questions. The only other thing I need is the white bow from his friend before going back to 4-2 to buy a couple more arrows. I've planned for this moment since the beginning. This dragon is the only reason I carried the ammo rule over to this version of the run. That's how much I hate this thing. According to the wiki, it's not immune to poison, but after 30 rotten arrows, I gave up and switched to basic ones. I don't care if each one only did 6 damage, I'll do anything to get that guy out of the way. Before taking on the final boss, I put some levels into Vitality one last time. Astrava drops another copy of the Rune Sword for our consideration, but first, I'm gonna test the Penetrating Sword since Alant is fairly resistant to magic damage. The first attempt goes as I expect, and I use the next one to test the rune sword. Surprisingly, both swords do virtually the same amount of damage, so it's up to my personal preference. I've used the rune sword already. I think the penetrating sword deserves a chance in the spotlight. Alant has the most over-the-top AoE that hasn't been topped by any other bosses, and can close the gap before your get-up animation is finished. How is this okay? To prevent another incident like that one, I kept the rune shield equipped for good measure. The jankiness of all his attacks is telling to the fact that there were just so many things the developers were still trying to test and work out. So as silly as the fight is, I do have a certain level of appreciation for it. Fights like him paved the way for much more engaging, polished fights like Ishin. Only after fighting him again did I notice the similarities between their attacks. He became a lot easier when I used the hit-and-run method, waiting out a couple ranged attacks, then going in for a few hits. The only problem is this method took over 15 minutes, but when you can't upgrade your weapon, what else can you do? Now for the final final boss, this pathetic blob, the true form of the king. Obviously, I didn't need anything for this so I arrogantly removed my healing items and stayed in body form to prove that I could beat the hardest boss in the game with only my fists. And well, would you look at what happened. I let it get me down to one hit. That's right. 
I nearly died to King Alant. I understand what he means. Things are looking kinda hopeless in Boletaria these days. There we go. The marathon of 15 minute boss fights is over, and we can leave the rest to the Maiden in Black. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed watching me take it one level at a time with equipment. It was a very fun playthrough, and I think you would have a lot of fun if you try it yourself. So, until next year, and I hope you have a great new year.